Thank you, Julie. Um, hi, everybody. A very early happy Thanksgiving to you. I hope that you are well. Those of us who are in the States, you know, this is quite a Thanksgiving in the United States. Those of us who are somehow convened in this digital space and therefore connected to the American holiday of Thanksgiving, um, it's good to be together. And it's really great to name a week of gratitude. And it's even better, just to jump to some of the Torah that I, I hope we'll share, um, to think about what scheduling gratitude means. What a strange idea. Today, I'm going to be grateful. That's like saying, on Yom Kippur, I'm going to repent. Tshuva isn't a day, and gratitude isn't a scheduled thing either. So let's hold all those weird, swirly feelings and begin our learning with a bracha. So I'll, enjoy, uh, I'll invite you, um, if you haven't already said the bracha, the blessing for learning, to share it with me. And if you have, you know, give your amen. And since you're on mute, feel free to, you know, sing really loud. Trust me, it's awesome like that. Uh, the final part of the bracha is la asok bidivrei Torah, to be busy with words of Torah. And then we add on a few words, hafochba, which means turn it over and over again. Ben Bagbag, a rabbi in ancient Israel, said, turn the Torah over and over again. There's always something new there. So let's, uh, let's decide in advance we're going to discover something new and sing a bracha. This melody was written by Rabbi David Paskin. If any of you know him, you know his music is awesome. And if you don't yet know him, look him up. His music is great. tell you, I think I've been sharing this a lot, some of you might have heard me say this, that um, if you are a fan of the Muppets the way that I am, you might know that one of the culminating scenes in the Muppets Take Manhattan uh, was when Kermit and Piggy finally get married, but the best part of it is that everyone who's assembled, all of the Muppets in Jim Henson's repertoire do this, they all sway side to side while they're singing. And I've been loving when teaching on Zoom to notice we're in the rhythm. There's something about our bodies that we're like, we're dancing the blessing in this really sweet way. So welcome, welcome to, uh, I don't know, a Muppet Torah. This is, a, this is a great conversation for us to have. Let me start with this. And I'd love to see um, your, your thoughts in the chat. Uh, Rhonda, Rabbi David Paskin, that's his name. Here's the question. What's Jewish about Thanksgiving? I know the right answer to that is what isn't Jewish about Thanksgiving, but let's actually look at some of the details. What? I know. <laughs> well, I was looking for the chat function, Ellen, but. came after the holiday of Sukkot. I think it was. One of the Jewish holidays. I think it was Sukkot. Um, right? <laughs> <laughs> There are lots of ways that we tell the story. 
maybe I should specify what I mean by the question. And I see some of us already offering in the chat function some of the thoughts. Um, what concepts, what is it about Thanksgiving that we can identify as Jewish? Um, what are the elements of it? So I see Fran is writing that the basis is Sukkot, as Ellen just said. Um, Janet said being together with family. Sharon wrote family and lots of food and gratitude. Frana wrote Harvest Festival. These are all true. And it's also obviously more complicated than that, right? Uh, when, hoda'a, right? Um, gratitude. Arlene wrote giving thanks and showing gratitude, right? Not just having it, but expressing it. Um, as you continue to write in your, uh, your thoughts, when I was a child, right? This is my, the image of Thanksgiving that I had. I grew up in New York, um, ended up moving to Boston and then Berkeley and now back in New York. I had this vision of Native Americans and pilgrims sitting at picnic tables with cornucopia like of food just pouring out and everyone had enough. And that was gorgeous. In fact, I made this pine cone turkey that my, my uncle still has to this day. He made sure to send me pictures. Um, and one of the challenges, as Devorah said, you, you said it pretty, pretty bluntly, right? I have an issue because this holiday offends the indigenous, we would say indigenous people. Um, and it, I don't think that's being negative. I think that's being historical. One of the questions that I'd love us to think about is, what does it look like to have an honest and adult relationship with the experience of gratitude and real history? So let's start at the beginning of the conversation, especially from an Ashken, Ashken normative, right? If you don't know that phrase, it means the, the wrong way to read Jewish history, which is to focus entirely on Eastern Europe and its immigration to the United States. Um, that is how I grew up. I, did, I don't think I had a notion of really of Sephardic Judaism, of Italian Judaism, of Jews of color. I didn't really have an expansive notion of Jewish identity. I just looked in the mirror all the time, wherever I went, because everyone sort of looked like me. I was the darkest among my friends, and I thought that was interesting. Tells you how little I knew. My in image of Thanksgiving perhaps was as simple as my image of myself. And so the deeper we can get into this conversation, maybe the deeper into self we can also explore. There was a time in Ashkenazi immigration and in Sephardic immigration to the United States where the question arose for the first time, are we allowed to celebrate Thanksgiving? It was new. We have Jewish holidays. We have holidays that are biblical. We have holidays like Hanukkah that are post-biblical. Are we allowed to celebrate Thanksgiving? And there's a great book. I don't know if people have seen, if you've seen the kids' book. I'm going to share a screen just so you can see this delightful cover um, of a book called Rivka's First Thanksgiving. Right? If you haven't seen it, I recommend it very highly. I think PJ Library just recently republished it. Um, there's a delightful cover, little girl with a, with a ribbon in her hair, with a picture of Thanksgiving turkey. Now, she is meant to be a first-generation immigrant to the United States from an Ashkenazi household. And so she comes home because that's actually how America was deeply introduced into immigrant Jewish homes. The children went to school and heard about these things and came back and told them. Now, if you've read a book like A Bintel Brief and you know some of the history of immigration, especially Eastern European, there were elements of shame there because if you immigrated, if you immigrated to the United States, you didn't necessarily have the vernacular. Paul Simon said that well, right? Holds no currency, doesn't know the language. That's how we arrived wherever we went. That's how everyone arrives whenever they arrive. So when our children came back from school and said, when are we doing Thanksgiving? Was ist das? Right? A real Jewish response in that day is, what are you talking about? What is this? So when Rivka, who you see, this little delightful Rivka, comes home and starts talking to her mom, her mom goes to the ultimate authority on all questions that matter, of course, the rabbi, because we always know. Just kidding. We don't. But anyway, they go to the rabbi, and they, Rivka's mom says, are we allowed to celebrate Thanksgiving? And he says, was ist das? Right? What is this? And he learns that it's an American holiday, and he decides, because it's much easier to decide this, no. No, it's forbidden. And so I'm going to show you the back cover of the book. The back cover of the book, I'm just going to read out loud. It might be a little bit small on your screen, 
I recommend this book really highly. You, you, you'd find the back delightful and worth the purchase. To the Rabbi Yosha Priminger, sir. This is from Rivka to her mother's rabbi. My Bubba believes you are the wisest man in the whole world, but I cannot agree with her. You may have read a thousand books, but you do not seem to understand that immigrants came to America to escape from mean, wicked people who hurt them and their families. That is why the pilgrims come, and that is why the Jewish people came later. The pilgrims were thankful, and I think we should be too. Signed by Rivka Raven. Isn't that sweet? And wouldn't it be nice if it were as simple as that? Just like our stories, wouldn't it be simple if our stories were as simple as the mistelling, really, of the first Thanksgiving? So trivia. Are you ready for some trivia? When was the first Thanksgiving? I mean, the first Thanksgiving in American history was when it happened. That's around 1621, 1622. But when did Thanksgiving emerge onto the American calendar? If you chat the, the correct answer first, I will award you 50 rabbi points. 50. If you do it really fast, it'll be 55. 1861. That's a great guess. I'm going to give you points because you're very nice, but no. President Lincoln did have a part in making it an official national holiday, but that is not the first proclamation about Thanksgiving. I'll just one more try. No, all right, we're going forward in time. Yes, Kathy, back in time. In on November 26, 1789, I've got I've got a cheat sheet up on my other screen. Thank God. I'm not showing it to you, so I have something to say, just so you know. November 26, 1789 would be a day of thanksgiving and prayer to mark the adoption of the U.S. constitutions and the establishment of a new government. That's what Thanksgiving was about, at least officially, when George Washington declared it. And listen to the language when Abraham Lincoln proclaimed it a national holiday for the first time in 1863, in the middle of the Civil War. In the middle of the Civil War. He said, it should be a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent father, capital F. And there were attempts over the years for Thanksgiving to be established as a national Christian holiday, which makes the notion of belonging all the more complicated. In fact, if you use that through Jewish eyes to look back at this notion of an American consciousness, a national holiday based on a myth, based on a story that we told, a sacred founding story, wouldn't it be nice if the way it really happened was picnic benches and Native Americans and pilgrims who actually were about religious freedom, not establishing their own rigid religious sect on the new shore? Wouldn't it be great if everybody had enough? Except I know, and we know, that the story wasn't that simple. Before we get to the complication of the American Thanksgiving story, does anyone remember when a few years ago Thanksgiving and Hanukkah coincided? Right, we had the what was it called the menorca, Thanksgivinga, right? Thanksgivinga, and like we lit the menorcas and like, it's like it was so weird. And in fact, real mathematicians, I'm sure Julie, you did some of this math. You're like you're amazing like that. Know that the the convergence will only happen again in seventy nine thousand years. So we'll wait, I guess. My point is, and I wrote a piece about this in the Huffington Post that year that our founding stories, the ones we learn as children, they're so enchanting and so not accurate. There is good reason to tell enchanting stories to our children. I would never want us to leave that behind. But when I look back at Hanukkah, is it really about rededication of the temple and the victory of the Maccabees over the Assyrian Greeks? Yes. Is that the whole story? No. Are the Maccabees the Hashmonaim who actually killed their fellow Jews who assimilated because Assyrian Greek was an attractive culture? And so is it actually a struggle for Jewish identity in the midst of a multicultural society? Oh, wait, would that make me look deep within and wonder about my own identity? I'd rather not go there. Let's just talk about the oil. Is Thanksgiving about abundance and arrival and welcome and coexistence or do I actually have to think about what colonization meant to the Native Americans? Do I have to discuss, and, and I, I hate to bring it up even, even though I have to, is it about smallpox blankets? Is it about the impact 
that any one of us, when we try to assert our truth, we're running for our lives. Trauma is a human condition. But when we begin to create our own mythic tale and we further erase the group with whom we battle, what would Thanksgiving look like? What would, a, what would gratitude look like if we couldn't ground it in a lived, shared, actual reality? So my question to us as a group of adults, in the midst of scary times, is given the reality of history and the reality of our current moment of history, what does gratitude look like? What does it look like to express gratitude? And, you know, I opened with this, Thanksgiving isn't a day. It's not a, gratitude is not a scheduled thing, especially not through Jewish eyes. But this year, what can it look like? What does gratitude look like for you? So I, I, I see some of you starting to, to give answers. I'd love to really read your, your, the thoughts of your heart. What does gratitude look like this year? And maybe taking a pause and thinking for yourself, just look deep within. Because I, I will tell you that it's not just, you know, the narrative of history that I think we have to look at cleanly. Um, in order for me to have gratitude this week, this Thursday, I need to also come to terms with what I don't have. And so I want, to, I want to ask you to really give thought, listen to what some of us are writing and keep writing, keep offering. I think it can be inspiring to see what someone else is reflecting on. It doesn't have to be your truth, but isn't it beautiful to see glimmers of gratitude? And you have to commit just a little bit when you type. It's interesting with Zoom. If I ask you to say it out loud, you, you sort of say it and then it goes away. But if you write it down, it's right there in front of you. And even though when the Zoom meeting closes, the text goes away for all of us, somehow it's recorded, right? It's sort of like the, uh, the Nightingale song. There's a great Wordsworth poem about how he wishes his words would be eternal, but he knows that just like the Nightingale song, it will one day float away above the trees. Well, for now, our words are right in front of us. Listen to these words. Hope, appreciation for what we do have. I am alive. Oh my God, right? Let's just say that. I, I've been, in my teaching, saying things like the ability to breathe, and then I think about everyone I know and everyone I don't, for whom breathing is a struggle right now. That's a real, my lungs work, and I, I should be in radical amazement. I should be brought to tears with every breath. There's a sun shining outside. Gratitude to be able to go back to school, to our mazel tov on that, to fulfill a dream I've had for 48 years. And yes, Fran, I agree, knowing less is still enough. The challenge is when, when you actually learn more, are we allowed to forget what we know? I think once we learn, we have to act according to what we know. That's a real challenge of, <laughs> of confronting reality as an adult, right? Only in Aldo Huxley's Brave New World and books like that can I can I be brought back to before I knew something? If you remember in that, in that dystopian novel, it's actually one of my favorite books because it just frightens the bejesus out of me about the world we could become if we don't remain aware. When people were dissatisfied and began to protest, the authorities sprayed a drug called Soma over the whole crowd and there was no memory of what happened and there was no hangover and everyone became docile again. But that's not really being alive, is it? In order to be alive, in order to have gratitude, facing the world as it is, knowing what we know, and looking for more to learn so we can do better. It's painful, but it's gorgeous. And in fact, for me, that's something to be grateful for. Rabbi Sachs, appreciation for your granddaughter who was just born, Mazel tov. That is something gorgeous to know. Being grateful for knowing what's next. I love that, Kathy. But leaning on each other and sharing what we have to get there. Beautiful. I'm just going to read, read the ones that are left. Although, keep pouring it out. May we never have enough time to recite the things for which we're grateful. Gratitude for opportunities to study. Gratitude that technology allows me the opportunity to connect with my family and friends when I cannot visit them physically. I don't know the people who developed Zoom. But, oh my God, did they save this world. 
And Julie isn't alone in the My Jewish Learning team. Look at how this platform is being leveraged to create community in ways we never could have imagined. You know, I used to be a pulpit rabbi, and I, I have no idea all the work that's going into build and rebuild community right now to bring people together. But I will tell you this, when it works, I feel like I've traveled through the screen. In fact, there's this beautiful teaching, uh, a dear friend of mine, Rabbi Jeremy Gordon, I don't know if anyone knows him. He's a rabbi of the New London Synagogue in, uh, in London. He's a very dear friend. And he used to be the modern dance champion of Great Britain, by the way. How many rabbis can put that on the resume? Um, he wrote an essay in one of the reflections on COVID that Julie mentioned called The Spirituality of Zoom. I want to tell you something. He, he channeled such deep wisdom here. He quoted um, Emmanuel Levinas, who was a French Jewish philosopher, who believed that ethics, right, the way we know how to be good, the way we know what is right to do for the world and for each other, all begins when you look someone in the face, which is a really hard thing to do. Really hard. I made the mistake once. Uh, I see uh, my friend Susie is here. Uh, Susie might remember that I once told everyone in my shul to look their neighbor in the eye for 30 seconds straight. And the hell I caught for pushing people to do that. But it's a gorgeous thing to do. It's very uncomfortable. Oh my God, to let someone in like that. And Rabbi Jeremy Gordon quoted Levinas teaching that ethics begins when you look someone else in the eye. Because once I let you see my eyes and once I see yours, I could not hurt you. I could not hurt you. So Jeremy says that Levinas would have loved Zoom. Because look what we're doing right now. Really, look what we're doing right now. How many gorgeous faces are on your screen? Look at all the sweet people from all around the world who are available to you. You didn't know that when you signed up for this conversation, you were signing up to show your face to someone else. How grateful we should be that there are faces to share. Um, it is a gorgeous thing to be able to pause right now and to have this conversation. There is a, a beautiful teaching that Rabbi Shai held, if you haven't learned from Shai, I recommend finding him online and reading everything he's written and seeing him in person. He's just a giant, he's so amazing. He, uh, and, and I'm davening for his health, something that he's very public about. So if you feel like offering an extra tefillah for a very special teacher, Shai held. Um, he teaches, he begins a beautiful essay by saying, nothing I, I could ever do. And this is what, one of the things I'm going to be sharing with my family on Thanksgiving via Zoom, this holy platform. Nothing I could ever do would make me worthy of the miracle of being alive. So I'll say that again. Nothing I could ever do would make me worthy of the gift of life. Now you hear that, and you might think in two directions. One of them is, wait, I'm never going to be worthy. I'll, I'll always be unworthy. The other side of it is, look how miraculous life is. There is a sky above me. I have feet firmly planted on the ground. I can see you. I can prepare for oh, the weirdest Thanksgiving in history. I can be hosted by this platform and learn with good friends. That gratitude is what we say every morning. You might already have this practice. When you get up to say moda ani, right? For a woman, moda ani, for me. And Shai points out how weird the order of the words is. You ever notice this? It doesn't actually say, I am grateful. If you take the words in order seriously, it says, gratitude am I. My very being is pervaded by gratitude is a posture of waking up in the morning. And I'll be, I'll be honest with you all, and I'm sure I'm not alone in this, in this Zoom room, 
um, these are hard months. These have been very hard months. I don't wake up every morning ready with gratitude. I don't. So I want to shift and just ask you to think about this. I feel grateful that there's an expectation of me. I'm scheduled to teach. I'm going to see, you know, whoever I'll see, but there's a schedule that I'm obligated to keep. If I didn't have that schedule, I actually don't know what waking up in the morning would feel like. On days when I don't do it, I have a very different kind of day, which suggests to me that responsibility is actually something deeply related to gratitude. So just for a second, I'd like you to think about that. What are you responsible for? What are you responsible for? And I imagine some of it is a heavy burden, right? It's not an easy lift to make. But asking what you're responsible for is another way of saying, in what way do you fulfill something? The capacity you have to fulfill that expectation can be an enormous blessing. So that's what I want to pause and ask you to think about. And maybe, let's see if unmuting works. We'll do it. We'll do it briefly as an experiment. What is something that you're responsible for that upon reflection brings you gratitude? Something that you get to do, that you get to have to do. So this is called popcorn. This is a big experiment. Jewish community does not typically do this well, but we're going to try. Rhonda. Uh, I get to go to work and teach kids. Yes. And Thank be God a, you do. a blessing to them. Thank God you do that. Bless you for doing that. Thank you. You're welcome. I have, I have, my wife and I have five children. And I got to yeah. tell you, without heroes like you, first of all, I'd be out of my mind. And second of all, the world would be a much poorer place. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. You're welcome. Who else? Who else is blessed with obligation? Takes some bravery to do this out loud, doesn't it? I am um, going to be doing a uh, conducting a lay led service Friday night, and the topic is uh, gratitude, and that's why I attended today, and that's why I have a picture of our ark behind me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so that's what brought me here. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Bonnie. Really, I, you know, it's so powerful for me. I, I at first think only of rabbis and cantors as the ones who are lifting up community. And then I realize rabbis and cantors don't know what we're doing <laughs> like without, without the lay leaders that create community and convene. There would be so less spirit. We have this phrase in halacha and Jewish law, berov ha'am hadrat melech, when more of us get together, that's more of God. So thank you for lifting up your community. I'm, I hope that this has been helpful, but at the very least, we get to share the work, which means something to me too. Thank you for that. I'm in lockdown again, and I get to take care of my household and my husband. Yeah. John, that is so holy. May, may, may you feel cared for too. Who's next? Who's got something? This is uh, 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 Sarah. I am so grateful for my daughter who does practically everything for me. She's a blessing because I have an underlying condition and I um, now have found, especially with the pandemic, I thank uh, Brooke Hashem, she's there for me no matter what. Bless her. And thanks for sharing that. I am sure that you are a blessing to her too. Really, really glad you shared that. Thank you, Sarah. Um, <clears throat> Rabbi Kreder, I, I'm grateful. Uh, this is Jonathan Chicago. I work with Jewish seniors and along with other people on our excellent team at our nursing home. I'm responsible for bringing some sort of Shabbat in continuity to days and weeks and months that look the same month after month to people. And it's 
hard, painful work, but because I'm forced to do it week in and week out, I, I, I feel that we're just holding their neshamas in place just a little till this is over. Oh, Jonathan, that is very inspiring to hear. Thank you for doing that work. There's, um, there's this beautiful uh, series of teachings. We, we daven it in Hallel on holidays, but I always feel like it, it should be a regular mantra during the day. Um, my father-in-law, Rabbi Shlomo Karlbach, had a, a melody for it. I am your servant, the child of your servant. You've loosened my bonds. You've freed me. Meaning that kind of obligation which is generational, you know, as you're pointing to, that is an experience of purposeful freedom that couldn't happen if I were all alone. So I imagine it's, it's not a simple thing that you do, but I hope you feel some of the freedom that you offer others. Thank you for doing that. Oh, Linda, thanks for writing that in. You know, it's good that we're, we're, using, we're using the different modalities. I know I'm putting people on the spot, but it becomes such a deep spiritual sharing. Linda wrote, she maintains her temple's website and produces the weekly newsletter. I got to tell you, of any time in, in Jewish history, especially now, to maintain the technological connection for a community, give vault, webmasters are the real Rebbies, right? Those are the Jedis that make sure that we have each other. I see who uh, I saw someone just come off of mute. Barbara, was that you? I did see. Yep, yeah. It was. I'm like, ditto, ditto, ditto. I'm a teacher and I'm taking care of my mother and everything everybody is saying. I have connections with seniors and the, the amazing um, learning that I'm doing online with, with people like yourself, Rabbi, is um, overwhelming me. <laughs> hmm. Well, yeah, <laughs> yes, I'm so with you. When people share in these deep ways, first of all, it creates a spiritual practice. I know that my Jewish learning isn't only a place for religious um, experience. In fact, that wasn't the original you know, founding idea back in the day. It was a place for material to be studied and accessed. But what I find myself doing more and more as a teacher is, is being part of a convening of human spirit. And especially these days, that's the deepest learning we get to do, right? So Barbara, as you share, you know, you want to say ditto, like, isn't it a powerful thing, I'm asking you and everyone, isn't it a powerful thing that we can discover these kinds of patterns of common experience? If I thought I was alone feeling something, odds are I'm not really. When I edited these books, the different poems and prayers and reflections on the holidays, I found my, I, I, I saw, parents sounding all like each other, but parents sounding like single people, and the teenagers writing sounding like, you know, the retired people who are writing. It's such a beautiful thing. And I, and I offer this in the spirit of our conversation. What is it? What is it to be grateful in a world? And now I'm going to phrase it in a positive. That has forced us into each other's lives. That has brought me to a more active kind of listening than I've ever had before in my life. Gratitude is not a simple thing, right? We wouldn't be taught that it's something to cultivate if it were something that was always available inside of me. Gratitude in so many ways is a choice and not an easy one. I don't mean to sound cavalier about it. And, and, and I, I'm, I'm present with people who are in deep grief at the moment. And so I'm saying this not removed from this hard moment of life. I'm trying to say it in, in acknowledgement of it. How dare I, this is only personal, not saying to you, how dare I not weep with gratitude for the gift of being alive today? Now, what I do with that life to extend life beyond myself, that's my beautiful obligation. You know, Jonathan, I hear you. I hear you in that. With every part of my strength, I'm supposed to be part of building this world. That's, for me, what gratitude looks like. I look back at the childhood vision of picnic benches and Native Americans and pilgrims and lots of food and happy turkeys. I never thought about the fact that they were the food. 
<laughs> you know, and then the West Wing helped me humanize them because C.J. Craig couldn't choose which one to pardon. If you remember that episode, it's a really good one. And um, what that evoked for me as a child was everyone having enough. Everyone having enough. Now, we are woefully far from that, aren't we? But how grateful I am that we get to name that as our goal. It might not have looked like picnic benches with enough for everybody, with people getting along, not despite the differences, but in acknowledgement and celebration of them. But maybe that's not the history we had. Maybe that's the future we're supposed to aim for. Maybe Hanukkah and this rededication doesn't have to ignore the horrific details of the real historical Hanukkah. Maybe the goal is to extend light, not to force it upon anyone. Maybe each of our childhood narratives and all of the days that have these specific mythic stories, maybe they are all opportunities to feel grateful because we get to do something about the world. We get to do something for the world. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who we just lost, what a towering figure. He had this beautiful TED Talk, if you haven't seen it, I recommend it very highly, where he suggested that we should do a global replace. I don't know if anyone plays with Word documents and you can like look for a certain word and every time it appears, replace it. So you only have to do that once. I love that tool. As an editor, it's a great tool. Um, he said, every time you use the word self, try out using the word other. So instead of self-care, it would be other care. Instead of self-esteem, it would be other esteem. You know, it, it's a very powerful thing to think about the word essential these days. I think about that in concert with Rabbi Sachs. Because we use the word essential to talk about nurses and doctors and sanitation workers and those who stock the shelves in a grocery. But essential is a euphemism. It's, it sounds like a compliment, right? But essential actually means someone who doesn't have the choice to pivot and do their work remotely. What a moment of humility for those of us who have the, it doesn't feel like this every moment, but the privilege of doing what we're doing right now. The privilege of reflecting on gratitude because we have time, technology, support, food, a roof. You know, the inequalities in society that have only been exacerbated by this pandemic they can absolutely get in the way of gratitude, can't they? Because we look at the real world. But the question is, this week, what, what are we gonna do to rebuild our insides so that our bodies and souls can be part of rebuilding the outside? What will gratitude look like? What's the story our children and our children's children and all of, all of the future, how will they look back and measure what we did now? how grateful we should be that we get to make some of those decisions right now, this week. Oh, Julie, you're so good. I need, I need someone like Julie all the time. When I make these random references, they can get recorded somewhere. There are links here. So, what I wanted to do before we begin winding down a little bit, I have a midrash to share toward the end, is to ask you, right, who are you, um, not who are you physically sharing Thanksgiving with? Because that's a complicated question this year. But who's with you? And I mean with. Who's with you? Who do you want to talk to this Thanksgiving? The moment to reflect on that is now. Because I've always found it weird that we have a day scheduled for gratitude. Again, it's like saying we only do tshuva on Yom Kippur. It's always the, I learned from the great Rebbe John Lewis, it's always the right time to do the right thing. Gratitude feels like a very right thing to do. So who's with you right now? 
What do you want to say to them? How do you want to pour out your gratitude right now? Don't wait until Thursday. There's no reason to wait until Thursday. And so as we prepare for Thanksgiving through Jewish eyes, because those are the eyes you and I have, I invite you, just for a second, to look at whatever light is nearby. Just find a window, find someone else's eyes, find the sky, find a nice bright light. I've been enjoying the, the, the blessing of having a light switch since it's getting dark so early. I really appreciate light. And just recognize that it's reflected in your eyes too. You're not just receiving it, you're transmitting it. And when we're done with this conversation, I know this is you know, there's a difference between learning and, and sort of pastoral soapboxing, like the things I wanna get us to do. But just imagine if you took some of the gratitude that you've been reflecting on during the conversation and you called someone right away, right away. And you said, I'm feeling gratitude and I want to share it with you. I mean, what's Thanksgiving through Jewish eyes? Every day, every second. Is that possible? No, definitely not. <laughs> it's, it's just too much. But it's never the wrong time. There's a, there are conflicting traditions. This is the last Midrash I'm going to share. There's conflicting traditions about where the materials were, what materials were used in the creation of the first human being. Right? The first human being, um, we misname in English Adam. That's not actually the name. The first human being was Adam, and Adam from Adama, a better translation wouldn't be Adam, it would be earthling, like earth being, from the earth. So the question is asked, where did that earth come from? And as you might imagine in the Midrash, right, classic rabbinic Midrash, the two answers represent two different worldviews. One answer is the earth came from Jerusalem. Right? The earth that created that first human being came from our axis mundi, our pole around which our world rotates. We, we face Jerusalem when we pray. It is the heart of of our people, at least physically. But the other, the other opinion is that the earth was taken from the four corners of the globe. One of the gifts of Thanksgiving growing up was that since I'm a rabbi and my father's a rabbi and my sister's a rabbi, um, we couldn't get together on Jewish holidays, but we could get together on Thanksgiving it became the most universal holiday and it was the biggest gift to our rabbis, you know, rabbinic family, that we had the universal prompt to feel and do. And as Ellen said at the very beginning of our conversation, so much of what we do on Thanksgiving is derived from the pilgrim's notion of what Sukkot looked like, the holiday of Sukkot with outdoors and the food and the harvest and the all sorts of things. The two different opinions, one that the earth that created the first human being was from Jerusalem, and the other that the earth that formed the first human being came from everywhere. Those are two different ways for us to think with Jewish eyes. Do I see the world as reflecting the truth of what Judaism is? Well, often I see that. Or is the goal of this kind of a moment to reach beyond the tribal and to see the dignity and the divinity in all beings? The original Thanksgiving story that I learned as a child didn't teach me that last one. The original story I've learned about almost everything, almost everything didn't teach me that one. I'm very proud of our tribe most of the time. <laughs> I love the vocabulary and the spiritual lessons of Judaism. But one of the big gifts of Thanksgiving, as Rifka learned and taught her rabbi, is that it isn't always about us. And if it is, if it is about us, we have to re-understand what us means. 
us is everybody. I'm grateful in, in this really unsteady global moment for the constant reminder that all of humanity is linked. All of us are linked. What am I grateful for? I'm grateful that I have neighbors and I'm grateful they have me and I'm grateful Judaism has been part of an adaptive spiritual community that brings the world in and doesn't reject it. What's the biggest responsibility we have? To fix the world. That doesn't mean make it Jewish. It means be active Jewishly as part of building this world up. So, Last thing I'm going to say. First, a little bit of a soapbox. I'm not speaking for my Jewish learning. I'm speaking for me. Um, when I see people speaking about traveling and ignoring the rules because they miss their family and friends so much, I feel what they're feeling and still worry. So I'm asking you, as one rabbi in the world, one person in the world, please be safe this week. Make good, responsible decisions. Don't forget the rules just because they're hard. Rules are there so that we can have an investment in next year's Thanksgiving. The most blunt way I've said it, <laughs> I put it on social media and I thought I would get in trouble for it. So far, not so much. We'll see if mentioning it this way might get me in trouble. Better a Zoom Thanksgiving than an ICU Hanukkah. So please be safe. Take good care of yourselves and each other. And, uh, and let's think about the stories we want to tell each other. Let's think about the ways that Thanksgiving can bring us healthily back into a posture of gratitude for the responsibility we bear in the world. It's a pretty awesome thing we get to do. And it is a pretty amazing thing that we get to do it together. The real question is, when we are not forced into these Zoom squares, will we remember to find each other? Will we remember that we're here for each other? Will we remember, I'm looking, Barbara, there you are. Will we remember everything that we have in common? Will we remember that my story probably has some overlap with yours? Not that I fully understand your life's experience, but if we spend enough time walking safely back in each other's proximity in the world, can we discover each other's common humanity? Can the mythic story of, child, of a children's version of Thanksgiving actually become somewhat true, where people treat each other kindly and with respect and recognize that our fates are intertwined. So friends, it's good to learn with you. It's good to be together. And uh, for all the complications of this moment, I am so grateful that we get to do this. And some of you shared big mitzvot that you do, big, awesome, holy things that you do. Thanks for doing them. Everybody, there are things you didn't mention, I know. So for everything that you do, thank you. And I can't wait to learn again together soon.